On April 24th, 1943, a fire started aboard the Panamanian flag freighter SS El Estero. Fire is always a risk aboard a vessel, but this fire offered a particular concern, because the SS El Estero was carrying more than 1,300 tons of high explosives, and it was moored in New York Harbor. What has been called the biggest explosion that didn't happen deserves to be remembered. A May 12, 1946 edition of the St. Louis Globe Democrat revealed a shocking secret. The day before, the red flag had been lowered from a flagpole of a terminal called Caven Point off of Jersey City, New Jersey, and replaced with the spoked wheel banner of the Army Transportation Corps. A ceremony was held during which Colonel John Scheiss, who the Globe Democrat described as a salty-tongued veteran of 28 years' service, told Major General Clarence Kells, commander of the New York Port of Embarkation, Damn it, sir, this is the biggest day of my Army career. The event to which he was referring was the departure of the last ship, a Polish freighter named Stavola Vola, carrying munitions from Cavan Point. The end of the shipping of munitions from the facility, which the Globe Democrat described as not large in its physical layout, which comprised only a score of barracks and office buildings, a 2,200-foot causeway, and two open piers, would have surprised the roughly 10 million inhabitants of America's largest metropolis. As the Globe Democrat explains, 90% of the neighboring residents were not only not aware of its use, they were even in the dark about its existence. The website americasfireboat.org explains that remembering the tragedies of Black Tom and the 1917 disaster in Halifax, Nova Scotia, many tri-state area residents and business owners vehemently oppose the idea of building a new ammunition terminal within New York Harbor. However, the immediate need for an ammunition loading terminal was so great in 1941 that the order was issued under a strict veil of secrecy that Cave and Point take up the role of handling munitions bound for the European and African theaters. The risk was enormous, the Globe Democrat reported. Although never permitted as a storage dump, 5,400 boxcars of deadly freight railed in from arsenals throughout the United States and Canada were always loaded within 24 hours of arrival. Cave and Point always had enough stuff on hand to level completely a five-mile radius and cause severe structural damage for 25 miles around. If it seems ridiculous to have taken on such a risk near such a large city, the Globe Democrat explains that the high-stakes gamble to carry on such hazardous activity in such a densely populated area was dictated by military necessity. Caven Point was particularly adaptable because of its excellent rail facilities and the fact that the river's depth at that point made it navigable to all cargo ships. The paper explains, while public concern was riveted on military campaigns in Africa, Europe, and the Pacific, the United States Army fought and won a secret, gigantic battle on a long concrete pier that juts out into upper New York Bay, less than three miles from Manhattan's towering skyscrapers. While the public was kept in the dark, officials were well aware of the risks. AmericasFireboat.org explains that the Fire Department of New York Marine Division was well briefed on the nature and scale of operations carried out at the facility. Every ship calling at Cave and Point to load munitions was required to tender a copy of its blueprint and cargo hold plans to the Marine Division, so that in the event of an emergency, first responders could quickly and easily access, contain, and fight fires on any ammunition-laden ship. In addition to these measures, the U.S. Coast Guard maintained an active fire watch and sizable fleet of pump-equipped patrol boats on a 24-hour alert around the pier, and the Bayonne Fire Department kept a fast reaction squad on alert as well. Every commercial tugboat calling the pier complex for ship assist duties was required to have substantial external firefighting capabilities to provide near-immediate response in the event of fire. The slightest suspicion of smoke or flame at Cave and Point was a five-alarm emergency, the Globe Democrat writes. 75% of Jersey City's firefighting equipment and personnel would arrive within four minutes. And yet, despite all the precautions, the smoke came. The SS El Estero was a 335-foot general cargo freighter built by the Downey Shipyard in Staten Island and launched in 1920. After 20 years operating in the general cargo trade along the U.S. East Coast, in 1941 the Panama flag vessel was operated by New York's William J. Roundtree and Company and under contract to the U.S. Maritime Commission, one of hundreds of aging vessels pressed into service to help supply our troops and allies abroad. On April 24, 1943, the day before Easter, the aging vessel had been loaded with 1,365 tons of mixed munitions, including depth charges, incendiary bombs, anti-aircraft and small arms ammunition, and, frighteningly, the huge bombs called blockbusters. 
AmericasFireboat.org explains what happened next. As her 5.30 p.m. departure time drew near, and with a pair of tugs inbound to help pull her off the dock, El Estero's engine room crew began to light off her boilers to build up steam in preparation for departure. During this process, an uncontained flashback occurred, sending either a chance spark or a lick of flame into the ship's bilges, which were filled with a thick mixture of oily seawater. Within minutes, a fire had established itself and began to grow, filling the engine room with acrid black smoke. Realizing the gravity of the situation, the crew quickly sounded El Estero's fire alarm and set in motion what is considered to be the single greatest threat to New York Harbor, or any American city for that matter, during the entirety of the Second World War. The threat was truly terrible. Not only was the burning freighter carrying more than 1,000 tons of explosives itself, but a 2008 edition of the New York Times explains, other ships with the same type of cargo were tied up nearby. On the pier sat railroad cars similarly loaded. In all, an estimated 5,000 tons of bombs, depth charges, and small arms ammunition were concentrated there. The fire, the Times notes, threatened to blow up the freighter and then, in a chain reaction, the adjacent ships and railroad cars. Not far away, fuel storage tanks at Bayonne and on Staten Island were in jeopardy as well. The Globe Democratic bounds. A conclusive blast would have doomed the Empire State Building, demolished Wall Street, destroyed the East River bridges, wrecked the subway system, shattered thousands of homes, office buildings and apartment houses, ruined rail and port facilities, and flattened the Statue of Liberty. She stands only a few hundred yards away into a million jigsaw pieces. Casualties would have mounted into the hundred thousands. The massive 1916 Black Tom explosion in New York Harbor, the subject of another episode of The History Guy, would have been, the Globe Democrat explains, a marshmallow roast by comparison. America's Fireboat.org writes, a full-order detonation would have exposed most of New York Harbor, Lower Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Jersey City, Bayonne, and the strategically vital oil refinery-laden shores of New Jersey to a blast similar to a modern tactical nuclear weapon. The crew of the El Estero attempted to fight the fire, but Coast Guard historian William H. Thiessen, Ph.D., writes in a 2009 edition of Sea History magazine, the engine room crew, armed only with handheld fire extinguishers, gave up the fight and fled the space. But, AmericasFireboat.org writes, help was already on the way. Word of the fire passed quickly from the El Estero to the pier, where a well-rehearsed response by the U.S. Coast Guard Firewatch swung into action. Thiessen writes that soon after the smoke began pouring out of the El Estero, officer in charge Lieutenant J.G. Francis McCausland arrived on scene. He sent out the call to the Coast Guard barracks and signaled two tugs to move the other munition ships away from El Estero. Meanwhile, Army soldiers responsible for the railroad shipment set to work moving the ammunition box cars off the pier. Still, in spite of the rapid response, America's Fireboat.org writes, the fire burning deep within the ship showed no signs of abating, and by 5.40 p.m., the heat and smoke forced the evacuation of the ship's engineering spaces and most of the below-deck midship areas. More men were needed. Leeson writes that the call went out to Jersey City's Coast Guard barracks. Ammo ship on fire. They want volunteers. That, Seaman 2nd Class Seymour Wittick told the New York Times in 2008, was the day that tested who I was. An officer announced that he needed volunteers to board the burning ship and man fire hoses. The freighter's deck and its holds were becoming perilously hot, the Times writes. Thiessen writes that the timing of the call to the Coast Guard barracks couldn't have been worse. April 24th was the day before Easter, and members of the explosive loading detail had been anticipating liberty for quite some time. They'd already donned their dress blues and peacoats, and many have just finished shining their shoes. But when the call came down for volunteers, 60 Coast Guardsmen stepped forward, eager to fight the fire. Nobody looked left, Wittig told the Times. Nobody looked right. Nobody looked backwards. The men that volunteered all stepped forward immediately. With men hanging from the cabs and riding fenders, these and rights, while red lights flashed and horns blared, the truck sped down the eight-mile stretch of road to the waterfront, passing long shoremen and dock workers marching in the opposite direction to escape the fire. The truck screeched to a halt at the pier, and the men hustled to the burning ship to join their shipmates, already fighting the fire. Seaman Wittick could feel the heat through the soles of his shoes, the Times adds. America's Fireboat.org writes that the Coast Guard dispatched a call to the Fire Department of New York Marine Unit Headquarters for urgent assistance. The New York Times wrote a day after the fire, the New York Fireboat's firefighter and John J. Harvey were sent from the battery to the burning vessel. Thiessen writes that the fireboats pumped a tremendous volume of water on board, but the oil fire continued to gain ground. Flames could be seen escaping through El Estero's skylights, hatches, and scoop-like ventilators while the heat cooked deck plates. America's Fireboat.org explains, with an explosion still perilously imminent by 7 p.m., despite strident firefighting efforts, 
Captain of the port, Rear Admiral Stanley Parker, issued the order that the El Estero be immediately scuttled. But with her seacocks located deep below decks and therefore rendered inaccessible by the intense fire, the order could not be carried out. The April 25, 1943 edition of the New York Times wrote that when it was discovered that the flames could not be readily extinguished, the Navy ordered the merchantmen towed down the bay and run aground at a point where if an explosion occurred there would be less danger of causing destruction not only among ships in the harbor but on land. The commercial tugboats Margaret Olson, Ola G. Olson, George R. Randolph, and Beatrice Bush had been called to the ship. The Times wrote in 2008, in a race against time, the tugboats towed the Estero to deep waters in Upper New York Bay. Thiessen writes that, once Coast Guard officials made the decision to move El Estero, Lieutenant Commander Stanley asked for 20 volunteers to stay on board with him to fight the fire during the transit to the Upper Harbor. Far more men volunteered than the number necessary, and many had to be ordered off. Among those who were kicked off was Seaman Wittick, who at 22 years old was engaged to be married. He volunteered to stay, but Thiessen writes, The ranking bosun's mate yelled, You're getting married in a few weeks! Now get the hell off! The Times wrote in 2008, Before he climbed down a rope ladder to a small boat bobbing alongside, some of his mates, who had to stay a bit longer, handed him their wallets. He remembers one man saying to him, Wittick, if it blows, at least they'll know. I was here. The chances of survival for those remaining on board the ship seemed slim indeed, Thiessen wrote. Thiessen continues, by 7 p.m. the seamen aboard El Estero had managed to secure a steel hauser to the ship's bow and the tugboats began pulling it out into New York Harbor. Eventually the convoy of tugboats, fireboats, and El Estero reached the target area and the Coast Guard crew successfully anchored the vessel in 40 feet of water near the unmanned Robbins Reef lighthouse. Despite the gravity of the situation, officials had still not warned local residents. America's Fireboat.org explains, By the time the slow convoy began to make headway into lower New York Harbor, the rapidly setting sun revealed to shoreside onlookers the ominous orange glow emanating from what seemed like the entire length of the burning ship in the harbor. With the spectacle only serving to attract more curious crowds to windows and along the shoreline, officials were left no option to, but to break the silence surrounding the events playing out at Caven Point. The Times wrote on April 25th, At 8.20, Acting Police Commissioner Louis Castuma sent a special warning to radio stations to be broadcast. It asked residents on the waterfronts of Bayonne, New Jersey, and Tompkinsville, Staten Island, to keep away from the scene, explaining that a large vessel is a fire containing explosive cargo anchored at Bayonne, New Jersey. It asked residents of Bayonne, Tompkinsville, Bay Ridge, and metropolitan area generally to open their windows slightly and then keep away from them. But of course, warnings are not always heeded. Despite the police orders, the Times continues, the radio announcement sent several hundred persons in Jersey City Bay on Tompkinsville Bay Ridge and Fort Hamilton to vantage points in an effort to view the fire, and added, except for the activities of the disaster control workers, the waterfront communities paid little heed to the danger of a vast explosion. Having been towed to the upper harbor, the fire remained out of control. The Times wrote that an indication that the fire was getting beyond the crews of the firefighter and the Harvey was given at 8.35 p.m. when the fireboat Smoke Tinder, which had taken up quarters at the battery to replace them, was called to the scene. America's Fireboat.org writes that with the last of the volunteer crew safely removed from the still-burning ship onto Coast Guard fireboats, firefighter and the John J. Harvey directed their combined 36,000 gallons per minute pumping capacity into the El Estero's holds in an all-out effort to sink the ship. Thiessen writes that a little past nine o'clock in the evening, El Estero finally filled with water and settled to the bottom. The flooded vessel rumbled to belt smoke and steam as it cooled in the cold water of New York Harbor. The Times reported that men from city fireboats, risking the danger of being blown to bits with the ship and its cargo, sank the vessel at 9.15 p.m. The ship listed sharply to starboard, spilling cargo from the decks into the bay, and then settled to the bottom, hissing and steaming. Thus, they continue... They eliminated the peril of a major high-explosive blast by surrounding the vessel's hulk with walls of water. Although, the Times writes, not until nearly two hours later was the fire completely out. It was only after that, at 10.20 p.m., that the Navy finally issued a statement with Rear Admiral Stanley V. Parker reporting, Explosive cargo is submerged, and it is believed that danger of explosion is past. On the 26th, the Times reported that Mayor LaGuardia expressed satisfaction with the speed and efficiency of the fire department in handling the blaze. The weapons-laden hulk still, however, represented a danger, and in September 1943, four months after it was sunk, the SS El Estero was refloated using a coffer dam and the munitions removed. The ship was towed into open water of the Atlantic and sunk by the Navy as a live-fire target. 
In 1944, awards for heroism were bestowed by the City of New York upon the crews of the fire ships of the Fire Department of New York that had saved New York Harbor. And on September 25th of that year, the city of Bayonne, New Jersey, held a parade and proclaimed Coast Guard Heroes Day to recognize the Coast Guardsmen who had risked their lives to save the city. Several Coast Guardsmen received commendations for bravery for their actions that day, but some were a long time coming. Seymour Wittick and several others received the commendation medal in 2008, 65 years after the nearly forgotten event. Seymour Wittick passed away in 2009, at the age of 88. The New York Times wrote in 2008, Few who were there are still alive. The crisis has long faded from the collective local memory. Even at the time, most people in New York and New Jersey were only faintly aware of the potential for disaster. Wartime secrecy, Mr. Wittick said, kept many details hidden from the public until many months later. Despite the near disaster, the people of New York seemed to remain largely unaware of the activities at Cavan Point, which the Globe Democrat called one of the best kept secrets of the war. After reports of the fire, the Globe Democrat continues, Next day, when newspapers conjectured on the damage that might have resulted had the ship exploded, New Yorkers shuddered. Unaware that such dangers seethed beneath the city day after day and under floodlights at night. When Jersey City Fire Chief Frank J. Ertel retired in 1951 after 45 years of service that included both the 1916 Black Tom explosion and the 1943 fire aboard the El Estero, he didn't hesitate to tell the Jersey City Journal which one was more important. The most outstanding fire of his career was the explosion that didn't happen, the journal wrote after the chief's death. To hear the chief tell it, Black Tom was a piker compared to the one that didn't go off. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.